Hi, everyone. I'm Connie Ryan. I'm the Executive Director of Interfaith Alliance of Iowa, and this is What's Happening, which is a weekly conversation with different leaders um, in and around Iowa, and we talk about a whole spectrum of issues, and I'm really glad that you have joined us today. If you are on Facebook, you can put questions and comments in the comment section, and hopefully we'll have time toward the end to get to those questions. So feel free to do that. And um, Bridget from our office will be um, encouraging folks on that and uh, monitoring all of that. So I'm very glad that you have joined us. And I am delighted to have my friend, Sonia Reyes, uh, join me today for a conversation and sharing her story. And we aren't really here to talk about her work, but she uh, does work for the Iowa Office of Latino Affairs, and she's not here in that capacity, but she really is here today as a community um, member, a community activist, a community volunteer, and also a board member of Interfaith Alliance of Iowa Action Fund. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I am so um, excited to have this conversation and to learn more about your, really your journey. And um, so why don't we dive right in? And you did have a long journey to get to Iowa. And um, would you share a little bit of your story um, and how you came to be in Iowa as an undocumented immigrant? Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I am originally from El Salvador. I was born there in, um, in 1992. Um, just as the war ended, um, I decided to come to the United States to be able to help my, my family. So I came as an undocumented unaccompanied minor at that age. Um, I arrived to California where I enrolled in, in school after graduating from school. Um, I, I was already to already I was able to already be bilingual by the time I graduated from school in '95. So um, some friends from school moved to Iowa because they heard that there were jobs here. Um, I remember I was making minimum wage in California uh, in '95. It was like 4.75 an hour. So I was I had two jobs, and uh, some of my friends said, "Hey, come to Iowa. There's jobs here. They pay more." Um, so I thought, what the heck, I already left my country and my family in El Salvador, what's another move? So in 97, I moved to Iowa and I've been here ever since. Um, as soon as I got here, I was, my friends were correct. I was able to obtain employment, making, um, uh, I think $8 an hour. I thought I was rich at that time because, you know, coming from California, making half of that. And uh, so, yeah, so I've been here ever since. Um, I was still undocumented. It wasn't until 2000 where there were um, some earthquakes in Central America where the um, Department of Homeland Security here in the United States decided to give, um, after you know, a lot of advocacy from Salvadorians and Central Americans, they um, gave us temporary protective status, which means that um, we were able for those Salvadorians and other Central Americans who were in the United States at the time of the earthquakes. We were able to obtain a work authorization card that we had to renew every eighteen months um, and pay the six hundred dollars plus the attorney fee every eighteen months to get that renewed. But that, that allowed us to be able to work here um, legally, which is when I make the the jump from working in factories. Um, and um, into uh, the human services field um, because I was already um, a volunteer with uh, Polk County Crisis and Advocacy here in town. And um, so they, they prepared me, they trained me, and they gave me the opportunity to start um, be able, to be able to work in the human services field. So that's how my career in human services started. Wow. And so... Um... Talk a little bit more about, um, not just for people who are from El Salvador, but um, to get temporary status, um, is, it a, it is, is it a difficult process? And a $600 fee every 18 months, that seems 
pretty steep, pretty high um, for somebody who is coming here to work and, and working on a, a, a temporary visa and um, may not be making, I know you felt rich at making $8 and, and whatever, you know, at um, an hour, but uh, that's not a lot of money and, and $600 is a lot of money. And um, so talk a little bit more about that of, of the process that, that folks have to take. Yeah, so it's a very uh, daunting process. Um, you first you had to, um, depending on what country you're from. So we have people here from many, many different um, countries that have this status now. We have people from Haiti, from Central America, from the Middle East. There's a lot of different countries that have this temporary status, um, but it is temporary. So every 18 months, um, all the activists that go to the White House and work with the Department of Homeland Security, they advocated every year, they continue to do so uh, in order for the, the TPS program to continue for those designated countries. So uh, for you to be able to apply it in the beginning, you have to meet uh, the, the minimum requirements, which is be from that country, being here when the disaster in that country happened, because usually that's when um, people are given temporary status when there's a, a major disaster in their home country, so they're not able to go back. And um, then you have to not have um, a criminal record, you have to have good moral standing, and that's how um, they, uh, the Department of Homeland Security uh, words that you have to be a person of good moral standing, meaning you have to present letters from people that vouch for you, that say, yes, you are a good citizen and this and that. And then, um, so you pay your attorney, the attorney fees, and that can be between uh, $200 to $1,000 just to fill out that application. And on top of that, the application fee, which has continued to go up, I think it was like 460 something, and now it's almost 500 and something. So closer to 600 now. And um, so every 18 months, um, your work authorization expires, which means your driver's license expires. Mm. And um, so we have, and uh, there were many years when um, we didn't find out if we our work authorization or TPS would be renewed until a month before it was going to expire. So it's a, it's a very um, stressful process because every 18 months, you don't know if you're going to be able to stay here or they're going to um, make you go back to your country. Uh, for me, that was a very uh, scary situation because I had been here since I was 16. I'm 45 now. So I've been in Iowa even longer than I was even in my own country and in California. And uh, so it was very scary to think about going, having to go back and leave my friends and my family and my children that I already had here. And um, so that continues to be, um, to be renewed um, at this time for certain countries. Yeah, and you and you do have um, two children, correct? Uh, two children. I do. Yeah, and so they obviously are American citizens, and so um, that that stress of potentially not being able to be in the same country with them is a huge burden um, for you, also. Now, did you um, end up getting your citizenship then? Um, not yet. Um, I'm not eligible to get it yet. So um, I was a, I was married to a U.S. citizen, and uh, she petitioned me to be able to get my my green card. It took us about five years to go through the whole process because when you come into the country undocumented, you get penalized. So you have to um, the you have to go back to your country to wait for the process, which can take between one to three or four years. Well, I couldn't afford to do that because I have my children here, I worked here. And so I applied for a waiver that President Obama was able to implement that uh, you can apply. And if you can prove that it, that it will be very harmful for your family, for you to leave the country, wait for the process in your country, and then they give you permission to wait for it here. So there's uh, a couple of ways that uh, you can get around that. But then again, you had to pay the attorney fees for them to be able to do all of that process. I thankfully, um, when I started that process, I was already um, working for the state. So I was able to, um, to pay for those fees a little bit easier. It was still a struggle. Um, you know, having two teenagers with all of those expenses and then going them going to college. 
but um, what we were able to do is so in finally in 20, at the end of 2018, I got my green card. And now that I have my green card, I had to wait um, three years to be able to uh, pay to apply to get to take the citizenship test. So that will be at the end of this year that I'll be able to apply. And then we'll have a big party. Maybe. I haven't decided if I want to become a citizen yet, honestly. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. I think that that is one of the biggest misconceptions that people have that think people think that when immigrants come here, we want to become U.S. citizens. When we come here, all we want to do is be able to survive and not be killed and, you know, be able to just feed our children and and be able to go back home and visit. Not really, we're not here to become citizens, really. Not, most of us are not. Yeah. So I haven't decided if I'm going to do it because the test gives me a lot of anxiety. <laughs> yeah, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who teaches classes on taking the test, so I'll hook you up with, with her. And <laughs> Oh my gosh, please do. It's so scary. Just thinking about it makes my heart rate go up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so kind of um, another layer in your life is that you are also an out lesbian. And um, so wondering if there were additional challenges, either um, as you have gone through this journey or culturally, um, how did that impact um, your life and your journey coming to and being in Iowa? There were challenges uh, for sure when I actually, when my ex-wife and I got married, um, we, I was not eligible to apply to become, uh, to get my green card through her because uh, same-sex marriage was not recognized federally yet. So after that change, then I was able to, to apply, which is why it took a long time. And then still you, we had to, you know, prove that we were actually married, that we were you had to uh, send a lot of proof about your finances and everything. Letters from friends saying, yes, they are they are um, a couple. They are um, living together and all of that. So there, there were those legalities, uh, but there were a lot of legalities. There were things that uh, even though we were married, we did not have um, rights to before. Um, Iowa passed same-sex marriage and then um, after it was recognized federally. And so those are some of those um, legal things. But um, in in my personal life, and um, you know, with just with my culture, you know, homophobia is alive and well, you know, everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I I am a straight passing lesbian, meaning you know, people look at me and they don't assume that I look like a lesbian, you know, whatever mm -hmm. that means. Right. And so people assume that always assume that I'm I'm a heterosexual woman. So I get to hear a lot of the times, a lot of microaggressions against other LGBTQIA individuals because people assume I'm straight. And so I always have to, um, you know, say something or stop those conversations, but also I have to constantly come out to, if, you know, to people that I meet, you know, in my, in my work and in my personal life, I love meeting people. And that's part of what I enjoy doing all the networking, but that means, coming out constantly and it's not always, it doesn't always feel safe to come out. And uh, so one of the things that I wish is that people would not assume that someone is heterosexual as soon as they see them, you know, just yeah. wonder, you know, like, let's just ask. Yeah. 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 Or not address that at all. It, it, right. It's not relevant if it's through work. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and just um, honoring who the person is, um, in the totality of who they are and all the intersections of the pieces of our lives. And, and, and as you said, not making assumptions um, would, be, would be a good place to start. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, so you've talked a little bit about your journey. Um, talk a little bit more about your life today then. And, and you're not here, um, for your work. And so we don't need to um, go into that if you don't want to. Um, but just the other pieces of your, your life, family advocacy that you, you do a tremendous amount of um, advocacy with and, and for folks. And so talk a little bit about that and what that looks like for you. For me, it's a, it's a very personal issue because I came, you know, as someone who was undocumented, who didn't know the language, 
who had to learn uh, about the educational system, about all of the systems that are here in the United States without guidance um, and just on my own, um, you know, throughout the years, making a lot of mistakes. So for me, it's very personal to be able to advocate for those who are here who are going through a lot of the same things that I went through. And I have the privilege that I was there and I know, now I have my green card and I have a job that I love and, you know, a community that I like working and living in. So um, I feel like it is my responsibility to be able to advocate for those who are in the situations that I was in. As I can relate, I can, you know, I still have some of those struggles uh, myself when I go, you know, to places as someone who, you know, speaks with an accent, depending on how tired I am, behavior my accent gets. Or, you know, when I go interpret for my mom or for my grandfather, um, I get to see a lot of the things that need to change because um, we're we're a little behind, and not just in Iowa, but in a lot of in the country, we are a little behind in uh, learning how to serve our new immigrants that are here, uh, so they can thrive um, in our country, in our state, can thrive. So one of the things that I do is I do a lot of volunteerism. Um, I do a lot of speaking engagements, just like this one, and uh, sharing my story because. A lot of the time, um, all people know about people who are undocumented is what they see on TV or what they see in the media. And uh, it, I believe that it's important to put a face and a story um, to the narrative that they are hearing because a lot of the time it's, it's just one small population that they are seeing. Um, you know, when immigrants or Latinos or people of color make it to the news, it's usually when something bad has happened. But we are doing so many amazing things that um, we don't talk about. So that I like to highlight that uh, within my communities and also um, be, you know, one of the voices that need to be represented uh, where decisions are being made. Because if we're not there and we don't have someone saying, hey, what about people who don't have papers? or who have mixed status families or don't speak English very well or can't read or have a disability or a mental health issue. So I feel like um, being one of those voices there, it's very important. Yeah, if um, if there's not representation at the table, then you don't get to hear that, that life experience and not that you speak for every person who has immigrated mm -hmm. here, but um, but it's an important story and a, an important piece of the the puzzle, and um, so I'm really grateful that um, that you use your voice in those manners. So you you mentioned um, accomplishments and and the um, and the successes of folks in the um, immigrant community, and and that's such a huge term because it's people from really so many different countries. Um, but it you know if we're um, if we're going to stay just generalized, um, talk a little bit more about that and, and accomplishments that that people have um, as they have come into into the country, into the state, um, and have contributed to really the success of the state. And talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, we have so so many. Um, I one of the things that I'm the proudest of is um, being part of. Um, starting the um, Iowa Latino Hall of Fame along with the Iowa Commission of Latino Affairs um, because the goal was to highlight those um, Latino Iowans who have made the state better. So we have people who have, uh, um, like Henry Vargas, who just passed away. He was one of our first um, inductees uh, for the Iowa Commission of Latino Affairs. And he was here advocating for so many years uh, for farm workers and farm workers, not just Latinos or immigrants, but all farm workers rights in the state of Iowa. He was alongside um, Cesar Chavez uh, when Cesar Chavez came here and he continued that legacy and he started um, a civil the Civil Rights Commission in the Davenport area. And, he, he just made so many so many changes in policy locally there. And he was also um, part of um, the group that started the Iowa Commission of Latino Affairs in 1976, when I was just being born. And uh, so there's one, we have 
new um, in newer immigrants or younger immigrants um, like um, Kenya Calderon, who's also from El Salvador, who has DACA, who has done amazing work within the credit unions in the state. She is there to support them and to educate them on how to better serve um, the underserved communities in the state. And so we have, and we have amazing youth in colleges who are doing amazing work. Um, there's this individual at UNI who started a Spanish column for, um, you know, to provide information for Spanish speakers, because we do have a lot of international students who are paying a lot of money to come here and, it is, and they don't feel included if there's nothing in their language. So um, his name is Nixon Benitez, and he started the Spanish um, column at UNI, and he's now um, writing for, uh, for Ola, Iowa, uh, in a column in English and Spanish. So we have a lot of amazing stories of, um, of Latino Iowans or new immigrants that are doing amazing things. That is um, awesome, and um, it's fun to hear the stories of of folks who have um, just risen to the challenge of um, contributing so much uh, to the to the the wealth of our our, our state and, and our country. Um, and on the flip side, we know that there have been a lot of challenges, and and always have been. Our our country has not been real stellar um, in regard to uh, new immigrants and, and how we treat new people coming into the country. Um, but particularly in the last few years has been um, um, very difficult. And so um, why don't you spend a little bit of time talking about some of those challenges that um, people are facing um, in today's world um, coming from different um, countries, particularly um, Central um, America and, and um, South American countries? Yeah, there's um, definitely a lot of challenges. There have always been challenges, um, but in, in the last few years, it has been enhanced. The um, outright hatred for people who um, speak with an accent or don't look like everyone else in different towns or, or in the state or the country um, are have increased. We've had so many people who feel misplaced, who have been here forever. Who, you know, it, it's really hard to be somewhere where that you love, that you are contributing to, that you're part of the economy. And but then at the same time, to hear on the news um, over and over, you're not wanted. You're being called names. You're being accused of things. Um, you know, you can't go to the grocery store without being um, labeled or targeted sometimes. That's happened to me, sadly, depending on what I'm wearing and how I'm carrying myself. Um, you know, I've, I'm treated differently by people. Um, I have been told, you know, I, I speak Spanish to my children. Um, I have been told on many occasions, speak English, this is America. And uh, so in things like that, um, also, I get a lot of phone calls from, from people who have been targeted at work, uh, who are told all of these things, who are being harassed. Um, it has increased in the last few years. And also a lot of people who, you know, a lot of students in school, I, my son goes to Iowa State University, and where there's so many um, racial issues that are not being addressed by the administration. And uh, children, um, the students continue to be, um, harassed and I think there's not enough policies or consequences for the students who are doing this or for faculty who are doing these things to students. And it's not just an Iowa State issue. There's, you know, many other places, but I talk about Iowa State because that's where my child goes. And that's those are the stories that I get to hear from my own child of things that are happening to him and to his friends. And um, that just increased in the last few years. I'm hoping that, um, you know, as more education, as more um, awareness, as we're having these conversations that people seek help because from what I've seen, um, some people are, are afraid to ask for help, are afraid to ask, um, uh, you know, how to better, be a better human to those who look different than they are. But uh, that's one of the things that I like to do, I'd like to educate and just provide information and resources if it's needed, because if we don't start 
by understanding that it's okay for us to be different, but we're all human and we all deserve the same, the same respect. Um, but yeah, that's something that I get to see a lot. I, um, because I volunteer a lot in the community, I hear about it um, a lot. So I do a lot of referrals for, to connect people with different resources. I have a cousin who lives out east and she has a son um, who's a teenager now, but um, she adopted him from a, a, a different country. And um, about five years ago, uh, some kids told him that, that he needed to um, go home to his country. And he has lived here since he was one. And so this is home to him. And he didn't understand um, why the kids were saying that. And um, the staff did um, a, a very good job of um, talking with the kids. Um, and But he, of course, was upset, went home to his mom, et cetera. Um, and so I tell that story um, to just highlight the importance of adults in the lives of children um, and intervening. And, and um, if you, you talked about education and you talked about um, having conversations, if, um, if somebody were faced with a situation like that, what would you um, suggest for them um, of how um, they could handle that. Either a person who's experiencing that or a, an educator or um, an employee, somebody who is witnessing it, what would you suggest to them of um, how they can um, help in that situation? One of the main things is we need to stop being just bystanders. We need to act. If someone feels icky and your stomach when some when you're witnessing something it's the probably the person who's happening to it's they're feeling even worse mm -hmm. you know the way that i chosen to live my life um is as if i was in that show what will you do mm. i don't know if you've seen it i never want to be <laughs> what's his name mr quinones i never want mr quinones to come to be like sonia how come you saw this happen and you never do, did anything yeah or said anything uh, so that's how I choose to live my life because um, if when things were happening to me, there were many times when no one did anything, but there were times when people stood up and made a big difference mm -hmm. and they were, they allowed me to center myself and sometimes find my voice in those situations. So um, I always say, just act like if you're always like, as if you're in that show or that you might be in that show, because, you know, do you want to see yourself there not doing anything? Um, it's very, very important for us to act when things are not are not okay, because you never know when you can make a huge difference for someone. You don't know if, you know, someone's mental health. You don't know if you can pro um, prevent um, maybe a suicide attempt. Um, there's a lot of that happening now, especially because of the lack of access to mental health services for uh, people who are undersure or uninsured. And uh, so we, we, we have to act as allies, you know, and I say I'm an ally because I'm an ally to so many other um, underserved groups. So we all had to stand up for each other. And uh, if someone is um, being a victim of, you know, those microaggressions or harassment, there are policies within the organizations where that is happening to the reach out for help. Um, you know, if you don't feel comfortable, if it happens in school, you're feeling comfortable talking to your, um, to your teachers, to go to your counselor if they don't if they don't work if you don't feel comfortable with them, you know, go to the administration. If you don't feel comfortable there, go to your parents so that your parents can ask for help, professional help outside. Um, because there's um, you know, the school board, we can always talk to the school board. Um, so there's a lot of different people that you can talk to. But um, I wanted to piggyback on the story you mentioned because both of my children are US citizens. They were born here in Des Moines. And my son, when um, our previous president um, uh, took office, when he went to school the next day, he was in high school, um, his friends um, were telling him, oh, now you're gonna have to pack your bags and go back to your country. And my son's like, well, my mom's Salvadorian, my dad's from Mexico, and I was born here, but they were still you know, saying stuff like that and harassing him. 
And uh, what ended up happening that day is my son was the one who got sent home by the principal, mm -hmm. not the other children, but my son, because they told him that he was distraught because of the election results. And so those are things that are happening. And, you know, and these were friends of his that were saying these things, but they're still very hurtful. So I think it's very important, like you said, for parents, pa kids are only repeating what their, children, what their parents teach them. So it's very important for us as parents to be aware of what we're seeing, what we're seeing around our children, and that there's consequences that we keep them accountable for their actions and that we teach them that what comes out of their mouth is very, very important and can be very, very harmful, but also very helpful if they choose to stand up for, for those who are being um, harassed. Yeah, and um, I agree that for those of us who um, do have children, adult or otherwise, you know, when they're young, they are listening. And, and when they're teenagers, they may not look like they're listening, but they are. And they are. And um, so thank you for saying that. And and I love your illustration of the television show. And I, I used to watch that all the time. And um, I think that's a, a, just a good thing in general to keep in mind of, um, you know, what what do you want to be on television for that show um, for doing the making good choices and helping people or, or not. So um, I, think yeah. I always say, Connie, if everyone is happy with you, everyone loves what you have to say, who are you not standing up for? Yeah. It is when you make people feel uncomfortable that you uh, might be making a difference because, or you're standing up for somebody else. But if you're in an advocacy or in a, um, in a leadership position, it's important to know that it's okay for people to not be happy with you when you're advocating for others. That's, that's okay. It's their own discomfort. It has nothing to do with you. It's their issue. You're triggered something in them that um, is causing that discomfort. It's not you. So, th and I think that a lot of us, especially, you know, in Iowa, we try, people try to be Iowanized. But um, when we do that, we are, um, we're leaving so many people without protections, without a voice, and without um, being a good ally, with, without allies. Yeah, um, fully agree. And as John Lewis said, um, be in good trouble. So um, I, I choose to be on that side. Um, and I want to remind folks who are watching on Facebook, if you have questions or comments uh, for Sonia, um, just put them in the comments there and, and uh, we'll get to them. Um, I do want to point out to you, Sonia, that Anna Clymer is, is on or was on anyway, and, um, and that she says, Sonia Reyes is an amazing activist for Iowa and the US. So, um, and mm -hmm. I fully agree. So um, you're, you. I know she's, um, is a, a good advocate herself. So um, one of the things that I observe about you as a leader is that you, just what you were talking about, that you use your voice, you use your power, you use the privilege that you have um, to advocate on behalf of other people with other people and really to empower them to be able to use their own voice um, for themselves and for others. Um, and so why is that important to you to, um, to really be empowering of, of other people? Because if we, um, as older, you know, advocates, as people who have done a lot or who have lived through a lot, if we don't uh, start supporting our upcoming leaders, our coming advocates, the, all the work that we have done is going to just you know, fall through the cracks. So it's also so important for us to foster those relationships with the younger generations to support them. And also to know that they will do things differently, that the way that we're used to doing things is going to be very different because we are living in a different era now. So it's so important for us to provide the support, but allow them to do things the way that they're going to do it. We might not agree with it, but uh, it's important for us to still support um, the cause and support them in the way that they're doing it. You know, there's been a lot of talk about, oh, this is not the right way to protest. This is not going to change things. This, you should be doing A, B and not C or, you know, vice versa. 
but I I really believe that there's space for everything. There's space for, um, you know, those more cordial um, conversations where, you know, people are just um, getting to the tip of the iceberg. It is important for people to protest and make the voice heard because that's what they need. There's importance in, you know, in other types of advocacy. So we can't tell um, any of our community leaders that we have now how they should be advocating or making their voice heard. It is their choice. So um, for me, it's very important to support everyone and provide all of the information I have in my head and all of my experience with them and for them to use that as they need to, if they need it. And I think that one of the most important things is like for us who are, I, was, I should say me, for me who is you know, getting older and who've done things in a different way to know that um, things have to change and that things uh, will be done in a different way that will be just or even more effective than the way that, that I did it. So, and for them to continue to pass that on um, because I had uh, mentors who took a chance on me who um, were able to provide me a lot of support and continue to support me now and if it wasn't for them, I won't be where I am now professionally, loving my job and lo loving everything that I do and that I'm involved in. You keep mentioning um, your impression that you're old and I'm not sure what that makes me, so. <laughs> <laughs> um. I, I've, my body feels old, like now that when it gets cold, my knees hurt, so that's how I know. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Um, so for folks who are not immigrants, um, but want to be um, helpful, supportive, um, they want to be an ally um, and, and, and be an advocate for um, people who are, who are part of the immigrant community, um, and particularly for those who are undocumented, I would guess, um, what would you suggest? Um, what would what would be ways that they that that people can be um, a good ally and supportive of the immigrant community? Um, thank you for that question. I think that's very very important because a lot of the times we want to be allies, but we don't know how, um, or we um, in in an effort to uplift the other communities, we silence them. Mm -hmm. So what I would say the first thing is when you walk into a room scan the room as an ally, scan the room and see who is missing from there. Is there Latino, immigrant, refugee, LGBTQ, uh, deaf and hard of hearing, disabilities representation there? And if there isn't, bring it up. And don't wait until someone from those populations brings it up because it's always us who have to bring up those things. So I would say the first thing, yeah, in your spaces, scan the room, see who's missing and bring it up. Reach out to um, people who you know in the community that might be a good fit for that for that particular space, or if they know someone who might be. And continue to bring it up at every meeting um, because um, it's always just a second, it, it's, it's a second nature. It's not something that um, people think about constantly. For me, I see things through my lens and um, because that's my line of work. So it's, it's a lot of the times I have made the same mistake of not having representation from you know people with disabilities or, or, or another group. And when someone brings it up, I'm like, oh my gosh, thank you. So it's important to remind people that sometimes it's not made or it's not done because uh, it's, it was on purpose or they try to uh, not have someone represented. Sometimes people are just seeing things through their lens. So um, it's important to remind, it's important to be constant um, and um, in the message. And if someone is saying something that is inappropriate, you know, correct them. No, wait, don't wait until the person for, from that community, you know, has to say something. And if they happen to say something, support them. Um, don't just text them afterwards and say, hey, Sonia, I'm so glad you said that because by then, you're not showing that you're being an ally. When you're, you're going to be an ally when you say something in the moment, in front of everybody. So everyone sees that you have, the, per that the person has your support. It's so, so important to speak up. Um, and also uh, just know that everything you know about 
people who are different than you is probably inaccurate because everyone's story is very, very different. You know, I'm here, you know, I, if, we, if we were to talk about my life in El Salvador and, um, you know, growing, to, growing up through in the war and all of that, what my perspective is very different from my sister. And we're only 15 months apart. And, but what I went through is very different from what she went through. I was the older child, she was the youngest. So it, it's, it depends on who the person in front of you are. So I always say, don't ask, never assume anything just because you visited that country or you know someone that's from that country or you're married to someone from that country. People's uh, stories and experiences and traumas are very, very different. So I would just say, just get to know the person who's in front of you without any abstention. Thank you so much, Sonia Reyes. I so appreciate you and the work you do in our communities um, and um, just your wisdom that you bring. And, and I um, am grateful for the, the time that you have spent with me today um, and sharing your story and being willing to do that, not only here, but when you do that in, in other venues as well. So thank you so much for being part of what's happening. Thank you for having me and thank you for everything that you do. Oh, you're so very welcome. For those who are watching, um, thank you for spending some time with us and listening in on the conversation. We are grateful for your time as well. Um, if you know of somebody who um, should know more about what's happening and, um, and Interfaith Alliance of Iowa, please do share. You can share this video um, on your Facebook page and um, we would love to continue to grow and, and reach more people. Um, if you are new to us and want to learn more about Interfaith Alliance of Iowa, um, then you can go to our website, interfaithalliance.iowa.org, and there's a place there where you can sign up for our emails and, and get our emails um, and a lot of good information. Um, and um, so uh, we're also on Instagram and Twitter, as well as Facebook and YouTube. Um, and I just want to say one more time, Sonia, thank you so much for um, spending some time with me and for all of the work that you do to make Iowa a better, more welcoming place. I very much appreciate it. And um, so I will sign off by saying, as I have been saying um, all summer, to remind you to register to vote. And if you are already registered to vote, then please help somebody else register to vote and help them figure out how to do that. It is important in our democracy. And um, in the meantime, stay safe and be well and take care. Thank you so much.